thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Eudo, for giving me the opportunity to be part of this very interesting and important dissemination conference. My talk is about the role of uh, ECB in front of the crisis of the euro. As regards uh, this topic, uh, we have uh, to observe that uh, one of the most important effects uh, of the economic and financial downturn, which started in the second part of 2007, was the sovereign debt crisis of some of the Eurozone states, namely Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. This group of states is known by the acronym PIGS, a clearly rude term indicating states who are unable to respect the fiscal constraints established both the Master Treaty and the Stability Growth Pact. The ceilings of 3% of gross domestic production on budget deficits and of 60% of gross domestic production on government debt. Probably the best known element of the European Monetary Union framework. The issue of sovereign debt is the climax of the economic and financial crisis and has not only shown the fragilities of the global financial system and in particular of the European Monetary Union in front of speculative attacks but above all, he highlights the lack of confidence of the financial markets in the economic stability of the euro area and of the euro. In fact, even the possibility of one of the peaks leaving the eurozone has not been excluded. At the moment, we know that this hypothesis is not mentioned in any part and article of the European treaties. If it were to happen, the economic and the political effect on the euro area could be probably devastating. In fact, an exit from the euro by one of its members would mean that the country was no longer able to respect the EU provisions and above all to repay its debt, particularly to its foreign investors. In order to avoid this dramatic scenario, the European Union developed, as we know, a set of new macroeconomic provisions and mechanisms designed to manage and at the same time to solve the crisis. For example, the Euro Plus Pact, the European Stability Mechanism and the Fiscal Compact. All these instruments show the fundamental weakness of the economic and legal framework of the Euro and of the Eurozone as defined in the Maastricht Treaty and the substantially not changing in the Lisbon Treaty. These European agreements have not addressed the possibility of an economic crisis such as the one we have at this moment and have not in fact considered the institution of a mechanism able to prevent an economic situation of such gravity as the, the one in progress. This approach, in my opinion, reflects the idea that for the European Monetary Union was sufficient to control the trend of inflation, to maintain the equilibrium of the balance of payments of state members in order to ensure the economic growth of the entire Eurozone. In synthesis, the Monetary Union was built on the unbelievable naive assumption that there would be no crisis. This model has not been modified by the recent, recent Lisbon Treaty. On the contrary, in the light of the effects of the current crisis, there should be at a senior European level a series of economic plans to directly stimulate the growth in employment, especially among the young, the sector of the European population most affected by the crisis. This, this has been enlightened on several occasions by the European Union Commission in their official economic reports and forecasts. But as we know, economic and fiscal policies are not included within the competence of the European Union. They remain firmly in the hands of state, see Article 100. 20 and 121. At the same time, the Euro countries are unable to finance economic plans to stimulate their economy because on one hand, they do not have enough financial resources and on the other hand, they could be running the risk of breaking the rules of Maastricht and the provision of the stability growth pact. Besides, the Euro states are not allowed in order to balance their books and to give a new stimulus to their economy, as monetary policy is by now, as we know, in the responsibility of the European Union. 
It is clear that it is not longer possible to maintain a single monetary policy with the largely decentralized fiscal and the economic policies. Robert Mandel, Nobel Prize for Economy and the father of the theory of optimum economic area, maintains that in order to realize a monetary area, there must be a full free movement of goods and capitals, a system of fixed exchange rates and uh, an economic policy not separated by monetary policy. Few of these elements has been fully realized inside the European common market. For all these reasons, it is essential to revise the existing European Union treaties in order to ensure that politicians are directly responsible to European citizens for the economic and political choices that the European Union must adopt in order to solve the current crisis, which has been compared by many economic observers with the crisis of 1929. This is a longer term solution, probably the most effective, but which will take time to come into being while the crisis also demands quick answers. Within the framework described, a central and a decisive role in managing the crisis has been carried out by the ECB, whose main task is to maintain the euro's purchasing power and thus price stability in the euro area. ECB has now important changes thanks to Lisbon Treaty that have reinforced, in my opinion, the positive action of the euro tower against the crisis and its negative effects. First of all, with Article 13, Paragraph 1 of the European Union Treaty, the ECB has been incorporated in the, into the group of a European institution. This way, the ECB is no longer considered, as in the past, an external body to the European Union. It becomes a vital organism perfectly inserted within the European Union, with the consequence that the rules of the treaties governing all the European institutions must now apply to the ECB. Secondly, with the Lisbon Treaty, we see reinforcement of the independence of the European Union Tower. I note with interest with the introduction of the procedure for the sele uh, selection of a member of the ECB Executive Board, who in, who in the future will be appointed by the European Council by a qualified majority rather than a unanimity. In this way, the members of the Board would not need the support of all states of the Eurozone, as happened in the past. The changes concerning the ECB continue to produce the effect of strengthening the Euro Tower and the framework of a European system without changing its mission to ensure price stability and a low rate of inflation. These aims constitute the so-called European Economic Constitution that finds its legal basis essentially in the Article 3 of the European Union Treaty and the Article 119 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. But with the Lisbon Treaty, these states, in reforming the articles regarding the ECB, have not taken the chance to consider the negative impact that the pursuit of price stability can produce on economic growth when inflation figures do not act as a reliable index for the future growth of prices. Despite this, the ECB has played and is still playing a central role in solving the crisis of sovereign debt. Firstly, the ECB, in full consistence of its mandate, reduced its key policy interest rate rapidly between October 2008 and May 2009 from 4 to 5 percent to 1 percent. In other words, the Euro Tower reduced its policy rate faster than any Euro area country has ever done in recent history. Secondly, the European Central Bank took additional non-standard measures to ensure that its interest rate decisions were transmitted effectively to the real economy despite the volatilities of the financial markets. The ECB decided to introduce two very long-term refinancing operations with a maturity of three years which were conducted in December 2011. This extraordinary long maturity of this operation, on the one hand, gave banks a wider horizon for their liquidity program, and on the other hand, credit to firms, companies, and individuals. In addition to these measures, the ECB has controversially decided to purchase PIX bond. 
This would appear to contravene European Union legislation, which clearly prohibits any monetization and bailout option. P specifically, Article 123 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union forbids any form of monetary financing of deficits or public debt. Why Article 124 rules out of privileged access to financial institutions by the public sector and the Article 125, while with uh, the no bailout clause precludes any one member state becoming liable for the financial liabilities of another state of the euro area? Thus, exclude any form of financial and economic solidarity between European Union member states. These European primary rules are based on clear and sound economic principles. In particular, there is an implicit reference to the risk of the monetization of sovereign debt that would inevitably lead to higher inflation and the instability of the prices, with inelectable cost to the economy growth. In fact, uh, according to the founding father of the Maastricht Treaty, the financial transfer between Euro member states uh, could create a significant moral hazard effect in the beneficiary countries, and so the possibility of encouraging opportunistic behavior with the further consequence of undermining the economic stability of the whole European Monetary Union. In synthesis, the ECB cannot purchase government, government bonds on the primary market. But the articles aforementioned don't forbid the purchase of governmental bonds on the secondary market. And the marketplace for the bonds that are already issued in the primary market and where the reselling of government bonds is possible. This was the solution adopted by ECB for reducing the spread between the peaks, government bonds, on, and the German bonds that we know are used as an economic benchmark because Germany is generally considered the state with the strongest economy within the Eurozone. Last September, this kind of monetary operation was confirmed by Mario Draghi during his speech to the members of the European Union Parliament. On that occasion, Draghi said that the Euro Tower would continue to purchase of government bonds until the the tension on the financial markets were reduced. At the same time, he declared that the purchase of government bonds for up to three years is not a monetary head to the member states because it is a too short loan to be classified as money creation. This kind of operation was strongly criticized by Bundesbank because it would create inflation and monetization of debts and thus favor the so-called moral hazard between states. In any case, what is really significant here is the ECB decision to take, in my opinion, an extraordinary action in the light of a, an exceptional circumstances in the European Union's hour of need. And so the ECB action is consistent with the aims set out in Article 136, and in particular with the aims expressed in the Article 3, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty of the European Union. The strong activism that has characterized up until now the action of ECB since the beginnings of the crisis is a direct consequence, in my opinion, of the political vacuum that has arisen within the European Union. The ECB has developed a crucial and essential role by providing the monetary answers that the financial markets were expecting, in particular, to be reassured about the reimbursement of peaks bond. In the meantime, the ECB has conditioned its support to the states by insisting on the adoption of stringent fiscal measures, such as the famous letter to Italian government on 5 August 2011, signed by Trichet and Draghi testifies. The use of the con conditionalities method is moreover confirmed by the recent treaties on the European mechani mechanism of stability and by the fiscal compact. In the new legal framework established by these treaties, the ECB plays a fundamental role, see Article 4, Paragraph 4, and Article 5, Paragraph 5, Letter G, in the granting of approval of financial aid to states in difficulty. 
In this way, the European Central Bank has become a controller of the national governments and the management of their political economy, especially when the latter have shown that they are not being able to manage the effect of the crisis. In this sense, uh, the ECB has in part changed its nature as and uh, it is no longer only a technocratic institution, but is now, in my opinion, the central hub of European economic policy making. Therefore, it is clear that the crisis of the euro is not only due to the lack of a coordination of the economic policies of the euro states, but in particular is the consequence of the absence of a fiscal policy at the European level. Only the transfer of the fiscal policy from individual states to European Union probably will solve the crisis of the euro. In my opinion, the action of the ECB on the financial markets by its different monetary instruments can only serve to limit the negative effects of the crisis, but it will never be able to solve the crisis definitively because financial markets are waiting for a political answer on the future of the euro. In my opinion, the choice for European states remains the one identified by Arist Bryant, unite or perish, we have no more time to lose, it's time to act. Thank you.